All right, welcome back to Let's Learn ABA. Today, we're covering operant and respondent behavior, as well as operant and respondent conditioning, and then finally, operant and respondent extinction. Operant and respondent behavior guide human behavior, and it's very important to know both. In ABA especially, we need to know operant behavior because that's typically what we deal with. As always, if you're looking for our study materials, check out rbtexamreview.com for RBT exam materials and bcbastudy.com for BCBA materials. Questions, comments, please let me know. Work hard, study hard. Let's learn ABA. All right, starting with operant behavior. What is operant behavior? Firstly, it is the primary focus in ABA. As an RBT, as a BCBA, as a practitioner of applied behavior analysis, we are worried about operant behavior. How do antecedents and consequences impact our behavior? Behavior is selected and maintained by consequences, meaning consequences will increase or decrease future behavior. Overall, a person's behavior is a result of interactions with the environment. An antecedent happens before the behavior. After an antecedent, a response occurs. Following a response is a consequence. The consequence is going to dictate whether or not that behavior happens more or less in the future. And through that consequence, it's going to affect the antecedent. If a behavior is reinforced in the presence of an antecedent, okay, that antecedent becomes an SD or a discriminative stimuli. The key word you want to know for operant behavior is evoke, response, and consequence. Don't get it confused with elicit and reflex, which are respondent terms. The keys here, again, evoke, response, consequence. Our ABC contingency, our SRS contingency. Behavior is selected and maintained by consequences. So what is operant conditioning? Well, operant conditioning has to do with consequences. Like we said, once a response is evoked, the consequences that follow result in increase or decrease in the frequency of the behavior. Reinforcement, as we know, increases behavior. Punishment decreases behavior. Now, it's important to know this last part, right? Behavior frequency changes under similar motivational environmental condition, conditions, meaning the antecedents. That's where the antecedents come in, right? So whatever happens, happens before the behavior is also influenced by the consequences. If a behavior happens in the presence of an antecedent and that behavior is reinforced, that behavior is more likely to happen again in the presence of that same antecedent or environmental conditioning. The opposite of true is true for punishment. If a behavior happens in the presence of an environmental antecedent and that behavior is punished, in the future, it's less likely to happen in the presence of that environmental condition or antecedent. Consequences go to antecedents, which go to responses, which go to consequences. It forms somewhat of a circle, right? The consequences affect the future behavior in the presence of the antecedent. The antecedent evokes the behavior. The behavior is influenced by the consequence and around and around we go. This is operant conditioning. Consequences increase or decrease the frequency of the behavior it follows. What is operant extinction? So operant extinction should be obvious if you think about it. If conditioning involves adding, right, or taking away stimuli to reinforce or punish behavior, then if we want to put that behavior on extinction, we need to discontinue the reinforcement of that previously reinforced behavior. So let's say in the past, a behavior was receiving reinforcement as a consequence. What happens to that behavior? That behavior maintains or increases in the future. If we want to put that behavior on extinction, which leads to a decrease in the frequency of the behavior, we have to discontinue reinforcement altogether, meaning we withhold reinforcement every single time that behavior occurs. One of the most common examples is a child who will scream for attention. If that child screams for attention, and then as a consequence, they receive attention, which reinforces behavior. What is going to happen in the future? That behavior is going to continue. They're going to continue to scream in the future. It's operant conditioning. If we want to put that on extinction, okay, when that child screams, we need to not give attention. That is extinction. We're discontinuing, re discontinuing reinforcement of that previously reinforced behavior, which is just screaming. This is going to lead to the decrease in the frequency of that behavior. Operant extinction is what we use in ABA, okay? 
Now, respondent behavior. Respondent behavior is also important. We should know this. All right. This is also Pavlov, Pavlov's dog, Pavlov's dog, right? Classical conditioning. Okay. Respondent behavior is elicited by an antecedent stimuli. So notice with operant behavior, we use the word evoke. With respondent behavior, we use the word elicit and we use the word reflex. Operant behavior is a stimulus response stimulus relationship because operant behavior involves an antecedent and a consequence. Respondent behavior only is concerned with the antecedent stimuli. There is no consequence. Consequences aren't controlling okay, the reflexes, just the antecedents. It's an SR relationship, a stimulus response relationship, not influenced by consequences. Again, elicit and reflex, when you see those, think respondent. When you think evoke and response, think operant. So respondent conditioning, also known as Pavlovian or classical conditioning, it's that classical or that classic experiment everyone knows, Pavlov's dog, the bell. The bell is paired with the food. Eventually the bell elicits the saliva reflex. It's a stimulus-stimulus pairing procedure, respondent conditioning. It's not as complicated as it looks. Consider a neutral stimulus. A neutral stimulus has no power over reflexes. Consider a pin and sneezing. A pin, for the most part, is going to be neutral as far as sneezing goes. A pin is not going to elicit sneezing. Unless you start presenting a pin with, let's say, pepper, which is an unconditioned stimulus, which leads to sneezing. The unconditioned stimulus leads to an unconditioned response or reflex sneezing, repeated presentation of the two together, the neutral stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus together lead to a conditioned stimulus. Our conditioned stimulus then elicits, okay, the reflex, right? The CR, the conditioned response, conditioned reflex, the sneeze. An unconditioned stimulus elicits an unconditioned reflex or response. A conditioned stimulus elicits a conditioned re reflex or response. The bottom sums it up. You pair or present a neutral stimulus with an unconditioned stimulus, which creates a conditioned stimulus, which elicits a conditioned reflex or response. An unconditioned stimulus elicits an unconditioned reflex. Think about that scene in the office where Jim is sitting across from Dwight and he has the computer sound and then the outtoid, right? He plays the computer sound and the outtoid over and over again. The outtoid makes Dwight's mouth go dry, right? And it gets very um, saliva-y. And he's pairing the bell and the outtoid. The, out, or the bell before was a neutral stimulus. The outtoids were the unconditioned stimulus. Through pairing, the bell becomes a conditioned stimulus. So eventually, Jim just plays the bell, right? Which makes Dwight's mouth get all dry in anticipation of what he was once given an outtoid. So the bell becomes a conditioned stimulus, which elicits the conditioned reflex or response. It's not as complicated as it looks. Okay, again, think about this equation down here. Take a neutral stimulus, pair it with an unconditioned stimulus, which creates a conditioned stimulus, which elicits a conditioned reflex slash response. And then respondent extinction. Okay, it's going to be repeated presentation of a conditioned stimulus without the unconditioned stimulus. So if we paired our pen with pepper, okay, what do we need to do to put that on extinction? Well, we need to repeatedly present the pin without the pepper, okay? Eventually, that pin is going to lose its ability to elicit the sneeze. And the Jim and Dwight example, Jim needs to repeatedly present the computer sound without the altoids. The computer sound will lose its ability to elicit the CR. We know we've achieved extinction, when the conditioned stimulus is no longer conditioned and can no longer elicit the CR. The CR eventually disappears from the learner's repertoire. The unconditioned reflex or response doesn't disappear. The pepper is still going to make you sneeze. However, the pin will not. That's respondent extinction. Summary, operant behavior is antecedent behavior consequence. Consequence influences future behavior in the presence of antecedent or environmental stimuli. We evoke a response and we condition through consequences, through reinforcement and punishment. Extinction 
for operant or operant extinction is withholding reinforcement for previously reinforced behavior. Respondent behavior is just a stimulus response. In SR, there is no consequence. We elicit a reflex. We condition through stimulus pairing. So we take a neutral stimulus, pair it with a unconditioned stimulus, right? Respondent extinction is repeated exposure of the conditioned stimulus without the unconditioned stimulus until that conditioned stimulus loses its reinforcing properties. Very straightforward, not as difficult as you think, okay? This is all there is to it, right? Go through this a few times and you're going to get it down. All right, hopefully, hopefully you enjoyed our Let's Learn ABA. If there's something specific you would like us to cover, please let us know. Check out rbtexamreview.com for our RBT materials and bcbastudy.com for our BCBA materials. Enjoy your holiday weekend. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.